I uh, hope you're all well, and welcome to this uh, fantastic edition of uh, NHS Stories with our, our partners in Delaware, the, the Hellenic University Club of Wilmington. And my name is Art Demopoulos. Uh, I'm really pleased to introduce uh, uh, Marion Archbell and to welcome uh, two old friends, one older friend, <laughs> Nick. Yes, or Nick. Yes. Uh, Nick's an uh, NHS member, um, and I'll have uh, uh, Marion uh, uh, introduce you just a little bit about the National Hellenic Society for those of you that don't know much about us. Um, we are a nonprofit foundation dedicated to preserving, passing on, and, and celebrating this Hellenic heritage. And uh, despite this COVID uh, craziness, we, we continue to try to do good things and, and bring uh, in, incredible people to your doorstep or to your to your to your home, uh, and this is part of a, ser a series. The NHS stories will be shared with the National Hellenic Museum in Chicago as part of their uh, Greek American story, so permanently archived. And we're really blessed and fortunate to have two incredible people. And with that, I will introduce Marion Archbell. We'll go right into it. Uh, who's the president of, of the Hellenic University Club. Thank you for, for hosting us. Thank you, Art. Thank you for the invitation. And second, I wish to extend a warm welcome to those of you joining us this evening. As Art mentioned, my name is Marianne Archbell, and I am the president of the Hellenic University Club of Wilmington, Delaware, an organization that for over 55 years has existed solely to support the continuing education of the youth of the Hellenic American community. And so this evening, it is my great honor to introduce you to Mr. Nicholas Gage, the greatest Greek American author and investigative journalist of our time, and also my mom's favorite author, and his daughter, Eleni. Nicholas Gage, as many of you know, is actually Nikolaos Ratsoyanis, a Greek-born American author and investigative journalist, born on the 23rd of July, 1939, so I guess we're days away from a birthday, early happy birthday, in the village of Lea, Epiros, Greece. Thank you. Mr. Gage joined his father in Massachusetts at the age of nine and grew up to become a top New York Times investigative reporter, honing his skills with one thought in mind, returning to Greece and uncovering the one story he cared about most, the story of his mother. His two most known books and autobiographical memoirs are the best-selling Eleni from 1983 and A Place for Us, 1989. Eleni describes the life of his family in Greece during the Second World War and the Greek Civil War. Gage's mother, Eleni, was executed for arranging the escape of her children from their communist-occupied village. Decades later, as an adult, Gage sought out those responsible for her death. A Place for Us relates the Gage family's experiences as immigrants in the 1950s America in the city of Worcester, Massachusetts. In 1964, Gage earned a master's degree from the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism. In the 70s, he started working for the Associated Press and the Boston Herald Traveler, the Wall Street Journal, and the New York Times. From 1980 to 83, he worked on his research, writing and publishing the book Eleni, which was then made into a feature film with John Malkovich. And Eleni was also cited by Ronald Reagan as an inspiration for his summit meetings to end the arms race with the Soviet Union. Mr. Gage first achieved fame as an investigative reporter for the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times with his acclaimed coverage of the Mafia and his two books, The Mafia is Not an Equal Opportunity Employer and Mafia USA. And it was also instrumental in exposing corruption in the past of Vice President Spiro Agnew, which then led to his resignation. During the Watergate scandal, Gage was the first reporter to hear of any of the Nixon tapes. So, Gage was, Mr. Gage was also an executive producer of The Godfather Part Three, co-writing an early draft of the script with Mario Puzo. His book, Eleni, has been translated into 32 languages. And the most recent book was Greek Fire, the story of Maria Callas and Aristotle Onassis, an account of their relationship. This evening, we have this privilege of Mr. Gage's insider's look at the crossroads of wealth, 
fame and one of Greece's most unforgettable divas, the great Maria Callas and her relationship with Aristotle Onassis. Eleni Gage, his daughter, has written for Allure, In Style, Elle, People, and was the executive editor for Martha Stewart Weddings, and has also written a travel memoir, North of Ithaca, describing her experience living in Leah, as well as Other Waters, about an Indian American psychiatrist who thinks that her family has been cursed. I could speak for our entire time regarding the multitude of both Nicholas and Eleni's achievements, but I'm fairly certain our guests have joined us to hear from Nicholas and Eleni and not me. And so with that, welcome and thank you so much for joining us this evening. My so pleasure. It's good to be with you. Fabulous. I'd love to start with a few questions regarding Greek fire, with the first being, what surprised you the most in your research of the story about Maria Callas and Aristotle Onassis? Well, uh, in the general terms, the first thing was how Greek they were. Uh, they were very, uh, uh, very tied to their culture, very religious. Um, there's a wonderful letter that Maria sent to her husband, uh, Batista Meningini went on after they were first married and when she was in Argentina uh, where she said uh, uh, I met a Greek journalist here who took me to a Greek church nearby um, and uh, she said uh, uh, I have to tell you that uh, uh, I respect your religion he was a Catholic but um, uh, I, I never feel uh, as well uh, 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 in any other church except when I'm in a Greek church. Um, and um, she uh, carried a triptych of an icon wherever she sang. And uh, uh, she, uh, her, um, uh, one of her colleagues uh, uh, told me that before she went on, every time she did her cross, left to right in the Orthodox tradition. Uh, uh, Onassis himself, uh, uh, like to say that uh, uh, when he was young, he took pride he, that his initials were in every Greek church, Alpha and Omega, <laughs> Aristotle and Asis. And, um, uh, but they were, uh, what I admired most about them is that they were, uh, they both started out very poor, very destitute. And, um, uh, they reached the top of their professions. Maria Callas, uh, there's nobody equal to her, although there may be singers who have a more uh, 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 clearer voice. The dramatic power of her voice is unmatched. And uh, Onassis uh, built the, um, uh, the, the uh, at this time, the greatest shipping uh, fleet uh, in the world. Uh, and when he died, he left half his fortune uh, uh, for uh, charitable works. Um, among the first ship owners to do that, and others have followed. Um, what surprised me about um, uh, um, the most surprising thing, and the thing that I uh, uh, revealed, is uh, that they had, a, uh, they had a child together. And nobody knew this. Maria uh, told people that she had an, she got pregnant with an Isis and had an abortion. But in fact, <laughs> she didn't have an abortion. The, the, ch uh, the child was born on its eight month and uh, uh, survived for a, a, a day um, and then died because its lungs were weak. The same condition exactly that Jackie Kennedy's uh, baby Patrick uh, died from. Um, and uh, nobody knew this. I uh, heard uh, rumors about it, and I, uh, I, I got the birth certificate and the death certificate issued the same day. I found a picture of the baby that Maria kept in her private papers. I was the first to be able to read her private papers, and I confirmed it by uh, talking to both the maid and the butler that Maria had in her home. So that was a, a major revelation and it's easily verified uh, um, because if you look at uh, Maria's Callas' career, she sang 
every year from 1947 to 1965, she sang every year at least half a dozen times. But from November of 59 to the summer of 60, not one appearance anywhere. So uh, that was uh, when she was uh, pregnant and uh, delivered the baby early and he died. Uh, Onassis at that time was on a cruise in the Caribbean with uh, Winston Churchill and uh, she took a picture of the baby and I have a cop, I have the original of that picture. Uh, and, and if you look in the back, you'll see it, it, the, the shop was, uh, where it was developed. The Photoshop is five Via Bonarotti, which is 10 houses down from uh, where Maria Callas lived, you know. So it, it's that kind of um, probing and investigations that I enjoy doing when I'm actually doing um, uh, uh, writing biographies or, 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 or investigative stories. But, and um, uh, uh, I, I never uh, let up on the, uh, on my investigative instincts and they've always paid off. And uh, so uh, uh, it's, it, it's, uh, it's, it's a way of continuing my investigative career while writing Whenever I mentioned uh, I was Greek, they would say to me, do you know uh, Maria Callas? Do you know, uh, do you know Aristotle Onassis? Um, I did not know Maria. I had met uh, Aristotle Onassis a number of times and I interviewed him for when I would work for the Wall Street Journal in the late 1960s. And uh, it was non-nonsense, uh, easily uh, spoken and very charming uh, man, a great, great interview. Um, I did a series of articles on him and Stavros Niakos uh, uh, for the Wall Street Journal. Um, so, um, and I was very pleased, uh, frankly, that um, when the book came out, uh, uh, the, the, the review that I liked the most was in the Washington Post. It said, uh, Greek fire illuminates not only its, uh, its subjects, but the craft of biography as well. So when you get that kind of uh, 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 applause, uh, when you spent uh, th three years on a book, uh, yeah, it makes it worthwhile. Was there anything that was edited out of the book that you wish had been included? Um, no, I uh, frankly, <laughs> I was lucky. The book was published by Knopf, and my editor at Knopf was a, uh, a man named George Andreu, who's another Greek. <laughs> so uh, we get along famously. He's now editor of the Harvard University Press. Um, and uh, so, uh, no, uh, no, uh, I, uh, I was able to publish um, everything that I discovered. Uh, um, I never had uh, any uh, thing, um, uh, anything uh, actually uh, censored from, uh, from any book that was, uh, uh, significant uh, that I can remember, luckily. Nick, I have a question for you. Um, you wrote the, the, the book, Eleni, and, and you, you made that into a feature film, and, and, and you have a wonderful uh, background in, in the motion picture industry. And it's been tough to get this movie produced. It seems like it's a, uh, a fabulous story that, that would lend itself well to the screen. Can you take us through that process? Well, when the book came out, I had several uh, offers. Uh, it was optioned for a time for a motion picture. The producers hired uh, a famous screenwriter, um, uh, a fellow who wrote Down Downton Abbey. Uh, what's his name? Uh, Julian Fellows. Julian Fellows, yeah. And he, he wrote a screenplay that... Um, had a sort of an English perspective of Onassis and Callas, and and it would, didn't capture the Mediterranean uh, joie de vivre of, of both these characters, uh, the producers felt. And um, 
and then um, they had the producers had a arrangement with the studio uh, in Europe, uh, Gaumont, uh, which is the famous studio. Actually, Gaumont made the first motion picture in the world. Uh, um, and uh, but the producers then had a difference of opinion, a fight between uh, over another project, and they ended their relationship. <laughs> and my uh, my option uh, ended, and I took it back. So um, it, you know, it's in the works now. And um, uh, Eva Mendes wants to uh, play uh, Maria Callas. Uh, I was going to ask you that. <laughs> and she she would be good. Uh, um, but with the uh, COVID nineteen, everything is. Uh, Frozen, so uh, we don't, would, I don't know. And who would play Onassis? That's the question. Well, uh, uh, I know who I would want to play Onassis, but uh, and I've told everybody. But I, I have the perfect actor for Onassis. Uh, in the old days, the best uh, it would have been Al Pacino, of course, but he's he's way too old now. Uh, but the perfect actor to play Onassis now is. Uh, Javier Bardem, yeah. who is a Spanish, uh, but looks like Onassis and is of the same age Onassis was at that time and uh, has that uh, uh, lively uh, character. Yeah. Uh, I think he'd be great, but I don't know if they can get him or not. You know? um, so, when we first connected, you had um, started to tell us the story of one of the photographs behind you. And I thought that leads kind of into an interesting set of questions. I guess the first is, what was an early experience where you learned that language had so much power? And then also would be grateful for you to talk to us about um, the significance of some of the photographs behind you. Well, when I came to America in 1949, there were no English as a second language uh, classes anywhere. And uh, I was put in a class for uh, learning disabled children. And, uh, but I worked hard and uh, within, I, I would say, I came in April, I was in that class until June, from April to June. In um, September, I was put in a regular class and by November, when I had uh, uh, my first report card, I had an E for excellent. They didn't give A's, E for excellent in English. So I learned the language basically in six months. And then uh, in the, in, when I was in uh, junior high school, I, uh, I, I, I got fresh in a class and the teacher kept me at the school and uh, and when we started talking, she noticed that I had an accent. She said, where are you from? I said, Greece. She said, write five pages on how you got here. That's your punishment. So I went and I wrote five pages. And I saw when she was reading it, she, there were tears in her eyes. So she had me transferred to her class. And uh, uh, she was uh, the um, advisor on the student newspaper. She put me on a student newspaper, I became editor of the student newspaper, became editor of the high school paper and my, the, uh, my college paper. And uh, in, while I was uh, in my senior year of college, I won a national award for the best published writing by a college student in America, sponsored by the Hearst Foundation. And it was presented by President John F. Kennedy at the White House. And that's, that sent a picture, top sent a picture is me uh, at 22 years old, uh, 23 years old, and uh, John F. Kennedy. And uh, to the left is a, a picture with uh, my wife and, uh, and me with President Reagan, and to the right with President Clinton. I've met every president since, uh, uh, since, uh, since Kennedy, uh, fortunately. I'll tell you one story. When... Um, uh, President Obama went to uh, Greece. Uh, uh, I was invited to the state dinner that the president of Greece gave. I was invited not by the Greek government, 
but by the U.S. government. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, we went to the dinner, and it was a, a long pie table, and the, the uh, guests of honor were at the top of the pie, and I was on, on the right leg. And as uh, oh, I left, he started we shaking hands. He shook my hand, and I said, "Mr. President, uh, you have uh, fought a good fight. Uh, you have uh, uh, finished the race. You've kept the faith. Uh, history will not uh, 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 neglect you." Uh, uh, and uh, he said, "Thank you very much. That means a lot to me." And he went a few steps down and he turned around and he said, letter to Timothy, right? I was <laughs> quoting, of course, <laughs> the, the letter to Timothy, of St. Paul's letter to Timothy. And he knew the quotation. So uh, that, was, uh, that was interesting. Um, so, uh, um, but um, I, had, I had good, uh, I had a, uh, uh, you know, I had the, uh, I, I, I had one of the first uh, Nixon tape uh, in the Watergate story, and I did a number of exposés. I, I got in late into the story because I, I worked at the New York Times in New York, and uh, the Washington Bureau uh, was uh, beaten badly by the Washington Post. Uh, and Abe Rosenthal, the executive editor, said to me, can you go down and get us something, and you know, put us in the game a little bit? So I went down, and I was lucky to get the first Nixon tape, which was a telephone call by Nixon to uh, Richard Kleindienst, the Attorney General, uh, to try to get him to stop the investigation of ITT, uh, which had promised to underwrite the cost of the Republican convention in San Diego. So it was a big story. And uh, years later, when Eleni came out, can you go get that uh, on the wall there? Yeah. I get a letter from Richard Nixon. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, uh, I want to read it to you. It's, uh, it's uh, funny. Uh, he never mentioned uh, the Watergate. He said, Dear Mr. Gage, my daughter Julie gave me a copy of Eleni for my birthday and told me uh, at that time that she thought it was the best book she had read in years. Uh, over the last weekend, I found the time to read it, and I completely agree with her high uh, evaluation. As one of, who visited a refugee camp near Salonika in 1947, I was particularly uh, fascinated by the vivid historical account of those times. The personal tragedies and the enormously strong character of Eleni made a deep impression. But above all, I was struck by the superb literary quality of the book, and especially the hauntingly beautiful descriptive passages. Could you comment on the documentary Maria by Callas by Tom Volpe? Maria Callas canceled many performances during her career, often because of health issues, leading to her being terminated from singing at the Met for many years. Many people said that she died of a broken heart, but I wonder if you found that perhaps she'd been suffering from a serious heart condition that was either undiagnosed or for PR reasons? Um, yes, um, Maria uh, uh, was deeply shaken by the death of uh, Onassis. They continued to see each other. Uh, uh, this, you see this picture here where they, he's kissing her uh, yes. uh, under an umbrella? Yes. This is the back of my book. That's a photo taken on a private island where Onassis went uh, on, uh, to wish Maria a uh, happy birthday six months after he married Jackie, you know. So they continued to see each other. Um, and, uh, 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 and she was devastated when Onassis died. And she basically, uh, until then, she was seeing uh, an uh, uh, Italian tenor dating him, basically to keep... Uh, on, make Onassis jealous. I interviewed him and uh, he said as, after Onassis died, she wouldn't even take his phone calls. <laughs> you know, she had no <coughs> interest. And uh, I think she, she uh, never, uh, never sang after that. She, she died two years after Onassis died at the age of 53. 
Um, and uh, 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 I, I, I think um, uh, uh, she had uh, heart problems. Uh, she took diet pills and they, that always uh, affects her heart. Um, but um, I think she also died because she had no, she didn't want to live anymore. Her voice was gone and the person she loved most in the world was gone. And she, <coughs> she didn't speak to her mother or sister or her ex-husband. <coughs> she had a purpose to live in her mind. It was sad because she could be a great teacher and uh, could give, um, you know, lecture and uh, guide other singers, but uh, uh, that's, that's not what she uh, Lenny, can you tell us a little bit about your books? Sure. Um, so North of Ithaca was my first book. It's a travel memoir about the year I spent living in Lea in, in the village where my dad was born, overseeing the rebuilding of my grandparents' house. So that was, I lived there in 2002, so 18 years ago now, and that was a, a great uh, year. Um, everyone else in the village was retired, um, but it was a lot of fun. <laughs> and then you described my first novel already, Other Waters. Um, and then my second novel is The Ladies of Managua, which is about three generations of Nicaraguan women, each with her own secret. Um, who have to come to terms with their complicated relationships to each other and to their country. My husband's from Nicaragua, although we got married in Greece um, on the island of Corfu. And then uh, my most recent book is uh, called Lucky in Love. It's nonfiction. It's a collection of um, customs, rituals, traditions meant to bring luck to couples getting married. Um, and I wrote that because I studied folklore and mythology in college. Um, and I love rituals. And then when I was working at uh, Martha Stewart Weddings, um, I realized that every couple wants a unique wedding, but not a lot of couples know how to get that. And a lot of couples are either marrying cross-culturally or they don't identify with their own culture or religion. And so not knowing what they want their wedding to be about, they end up getting stressed out about things like the colors of the napkins when really so many cultures have these beautiful rituals that can inspire you or, you know, if they, they are part of your tradition or they speak to you, you can do them exactly or you can interpret them. Um, and that was a really fun book to work on because, you know, it made me feel like deep down we all want the same things. Like we want our children to be happy. We want uh, the chance to offer hospitality. Um, we want to see future generations come. And then I'm still a journalist. I'm the articles editor at O, the Oprah magazine now. And I also um, write a lot of freelance travel articles, um, often about Greece. So. I'm trying to get it to give up a uh, uh, journalism uh, job. I uh, writing novels about uh, uh, our world. Uh, the, uh, you know, and she's very close to Greece, uh, speaks Greek much better than I do, and uh, <laughs> is going there in a couple of weeks. And, uh, she she will not let a year go by where she doesn't go there. So uh, and I have an assignment, but I'm not taking the kids. Um, yeah. Eleni, Eleni, what was your journey like uh, with respect to discovering when you were in Lia about your yaya? You know, I mean, what was that like? Uh, given you spent a year there, so and yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure you was, had your own sort of quest. And yeah, and, I was. I spent ten months. Um, and I uh, wanted to, you know, rebuild the house that my grandparents had lived in and also sort of to build my own relationship to the village. Obviously, I knew the story because um, I had grown up knowing it. Um, but, um, you know, my aunts always spoke of the village as a sort of frightening place, but they also loved it and couldn't really stay away. Um, and so I wanted to, to see what it was about for myself. So a lot of that was, um, just about, about spending time there. Um, and, you know, it made me, uh, feel like the village wasn't just a setting of a 
tragic past, but like a living and breathing place and, and part of our future. So like my kids have been there um, every year and they have, they love going to the house, which is now recreated because when I finished the house, we had like a little housewarming party and all the villagers brought me things for the house that, and, and somebody, you know, I was so touched because people were bringing me things from their own parents and grandparents and somebody said, well, nobody wants these old things except you. So, you know, they were um, in the house, like I have this huge, big wooden spoon and the kids are always like, uh, can we go play with the big spoon? You know, um, and there's a little fountain in the yard, not a fountain, but like it, the uh, water comes out of the side of the mountain and there's a little uh, these sort of ceramic hands that, that grab it and they love playing in that too. So, um, so it was a really meaningful, but it was also uh, a really fun year. That was a time when I did interrupt, you know, I did quit my job and I, I moved to Greece and, and, um, and it was really fun. Can you talk to us about the pomegranate? Oh, sure. That, um, so that's the symbol on my website. Um, but, and actually pomegranates have played a role in almost all my books. Um, but you know, it's a, it's a big ancient symbol of fertility. And I'm sure people know that on pomegranate. Um, we're losing you. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, that's better. Um, so I was saying, I, I'm sure everyone knows this, but you know, on, on New Year's, you break a pomegranate on the doorstep of the house to invite abundance into the family or the home. Although in New York, we do it on the balcony of our apartment because our door goes into the hall and they would not like pomegranate juice all over the hall. Um, but um, so it's a symbol. Um, it's also a symbol to me of, you know, the eating the pomegranate is what kept Persephone in the underworld for six months of the year um, when she went down to Hades. And that's why we have winter according to ancient Greek mythology. So it's partly a symbol of being torn between two places and being drawn to another place. And after living in the village, I sort of started thinking, okay, what if we're misreading the myth? And what if Persephone wanted to come back to the underworld? And that's why she ate the seeds of the pomegranate because she wanted to have a foot in two places. Um, Great. Yeah. <laughs> Nick, Nick uh, Costas Funzulas asks, how did the American establishment accept the marriage of Jackie Kennedy with a Greek, even a Greek tycoon like Onassis? Thank you. Um, they were furious, actually. I, was, I remember that I was in the Wall Street Journal uh, when that, uh, uh, it was announced that he was going to marry uh, Jackie and uh, uh, one of my colleagues came, uh, opened the door and said, "You bastard!" I said, "What? <laughs> what did I do? <laughs> you Greeks, you know, you think you can buy anything?" Uh, I said, "I can't buy anything. What are you talking about?" <laughs> uh, they were. He was not. Um, they were not happy. But what I reveal in the book is that this was maneuvered by. Jackie, uh, Onassis, uh, uh, Onassis had an affair with Jackie's sister, Lee Radziwill. And uh, he, when Jackie lost her son, Patrick, he, uh, he said to uh, Lee, uh, uh, have your sister come on my yacht. I won't even appear and, you know, to, uh, to uh, to uh, uh, find some div uh, diversion. So that trip was arranged. He, he didn't appear for a while and ultimately uh, made an appearance. And then um, uh, they, be, they established a good relationship. And um, when Jackie returned, uh, one of the reasons she went to Dallas with him because Tom Kennedy wanted to establish that uh, uh, he, he didn't want her to go. Uh, and uh, he wanted to show that, uh, 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 you know, nothing untoward happened and she was still, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, his, uh, uh, his dutiful wife. Um, and when he was assassinated, but most people don't know, the other, the only non-relative 
that slept in the White House the night before the funeral was Aristotle and Wow. Uh, this was in uh, 1963. Uh, and then uh, in 1965, he came, uh, he came to New York with uh, Maria because Maria was going to sing at the Met. And uh, they got a call from uh, Jackie's uh, uh, secretary saying that uh, they would like Mr. Onassis to join uh, Mrs. Kennedy for brunch on Sunday. So he hung up the phone and he said to Maria, you know, we've been invited to uh, brunch by Jackie Kennedy. And uh, uh, for both of us, you better go back. So he called back and said, well, there's only one place. Uh, it's only for you. Uh, the invitation is only for you. So Maria said, you go ahead. I have to study my score anyway. So he goes to the brunch. He walks in. And uh, around the table, there's 10 men and Jackie. So she brought him in, put him in a competitive situation with all these other guys, very successful, uh, rich guys. And of course, Onassis in a competitive situation started to pursue her. And um, he basically didn't want to marry her. Uh, and she arranged for an article to be published in the Boston Herald newspaper uh, about that they were seeing each other. And before the article appeared, she called him up and she said, uh, this article is gonna appear, it's gonna look terrible. Uh, and uh, we have to get married before the article appears. So uh, she went with her family to uh, JFK airport. They emptied a regularly scheduled Olympic airline flight. They got into the flight, flew to Athens, and from there they flew to an airport in the Peloponnese, drove to Scorpius, and, um, and had the wedding. If you look at the pictures, Onassis is very glum. Before the wedding, Onassis called Jackie in Paris and said, please come and, and save me. I don't want to get married. And she said, uh, uh, how can I save you? She said, well, if she sees you here, you know, she'll, she'll leave again. You know, she'll, she will call off the wedding. And she, Maria said, you got yourself into this mess, you get yourself out. So, and near the end, you know, they would be in New York, she would be in her apartment, he would be in his apartment at the Pierre Hotel. Um, and uh, the marriage was not, uh, when he died, she wasn't even there, she was in New York. Uh, and uh, he died in Paris at the American Hospital. Uh, so, uh, uh, people think that it was Onassis who wooed and won Jack, uh, Jackie. It was Jackie who wanted uh, uh, Onassis for, because, but you have to understand when, when John Kennedy died, he only left her a, uh, a pension of $150,000 a year. That was hardly enough money for, uh, when she married Onassis, Onassis gave her 30000 a month and it still wasn't enough. And she would go buy uh, clothes at the top, at Burbdoff's and other top shops uh, 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 on. Uh, and then she would send her maid, tell them to second hand shops. Even yeah, we're losing you again, Nick. I'm not. Uh, I, I, it's uh, like the fact That's because bad. she was a furious smoker and nobody ever saw, saw her smoking. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there were uh, aspects of her character that were, shall we say, uh, concealed. Did but it's all revealed in the book. <laughs> did he have any, did, did he have a relationship with the kids, the children? With uh, who, whose kids? Uh, Jackie. Uh, yes, he did. He he liked children very much, and he felt guilty when he divorced his wife, and uh, so he was very attentive to the. Uh, he, he he was particularly close to John, the bo the, bo the son. Yeah. Uh, and when he died, uh, the uh, 
the uh, he left there under Greek law. This was called the nominus mira. The uh, it's if you're the wife, you get a uh, at least uh, an eighth of of the fortune of your spouse. Uh, and in in Onassis' case, that would have been uh, over a hundred million when he died. Uh, but she, uh, uh, the Onassis Foundation lawyer, Stelios Papadimitriou, negotiated, uh, negotiated uh, an arrangement with uh, Judge Rifkin, uh, uh, the lawyer for Jackie, and she only got 26 million uh, because she would have had to go to court uh, to, uh, to press for her full amount and she didn't want to be seen as greedy you know appearance was also very, always very important for Jackie but that 26 uh, uh, million she then entrusted to Maurice Templesman a, a person she had a relationship with for a number of years before she died he uh, invested the money for her and when she died she her estate was worth over 150 million wow uh, Nick, uh, someone wrote, uh, Georgia wrote, I remember reading Eleni as a young girl and made a point to visit the beautiful region of Ipiros and Zagoria with its gorgeous rock formations brought to life in your mother's story. In Greek fire, the story visits many wonderful places in Greece, Naflion, Aitia, Delphia, Tira, Katakolon, etc. Did you travel to these destinations to see and describe them as in the book to bring the trips to life? Or were they all accounts from your interviews? I enjoyed the new information on Callus. I um I went to every place. I mean that's part of the fun of being a, a writer is to you and feel uh, and uh, uh, I was even on the Onassis yacht, uh, uh, which uh, was refurbished and is now. Uh, people can rent it, you know, but the, 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 the main rooms are the same, but the, they took the engine out, uh, which was an old engine and took a lot of space and they've added cabins, but uh, it's still the same pretty much. But uh, uh, yes, I, uh, I went to every place. I went to Smyrna. I went to, uh, to, uh, uh, to, the, to the house where Onassis was born. And it was for sale, half of it. They had divided into two parts. Half of it was for sale. And I told the Onassis Foundations uh, to, uh, to buy it. And he said, we tried it, but the Turks won't sell to Greeks. Uh, someone asked, did Maria Callas ever go to live to Scorpius? Oh, yes, many times, many times. Uh, and they, they swam together. The birthplace of myth, legends, and mysteries, it is not difficult to suppose that her ashes might even have washed up on the sands of their private cove below the white chapel to the Virgin where Aristotle Onassis lies, in a land where love is immortal, although the body is not. It's not even, uh, it's even possible to imagine that on this island, completing the journey they began in 1959, they are finally together and at peace. It's beautiful. Burning question, getting text to me, texted to me from multiple locations. Do you have any unpublished or half finished books or is there anything you're working on currently? Yes, yeah, actually I'm in the process of finishing a book about a Greek tycoon who uh, was born about the same time as I was, became the biggest hotel operator in Greece and died in, uh, in 2016 and had a very dramatic life and um, um, writing his biography and uh, uh, I've done 12 chapters and have two or three left to, to go. So, uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a way of, uh, of, of, of it, it, his life captures the, the Greek spirit, you know, uh, and uh, uh, what Greeks can achieve if they, if, if they set goals and work hard. It's just that the system that various governments have created in Greece, where the highest goal they set for young people is to become civil servants. Uh, 
uh, has, uh, has, has stifled the entrepreneurial spirit of the Greeks. Greeks were born to venture forth and create. They, uh, they are sailors and, and uh, shepherds and, uh, and the wandering uh, uh, craftsmen. Uh, and uh, they're not meant to sit behind a desk and, uh, you know, uh, shuffle papers. Nick, why, why didn't he ever marry her if he loved her so much? I mean, uh, the love of his I, life. I think uh, he would have married her if, had the boy lived. Uh, but the children, his, his, son, his daughter and son, were uh, against it. And, uh, and uh, he didn't want to. Uh, and and uh, uh, it took a long time for, for him to divorce uh, uh, his first wife, Tina Onassis, with a reason. I see. Yeah. They, they, they regretted it later. It's, it's fascinating that um, uh, while his legacy still lives with so much philanthropy, um, it still f- felt to, to this very day, even our own organization. And I, and I you know, uh, Stelios Papadimitriou's son, Andonis, is doing an incredible job at the Onassis Foundation. And it seems like through YouTube, that she's she's uh, having sort of a, a there's a renaissance about her as well that a lot well, of people are finding out about her. I mean, you could see so many of her performances. Uh, uh, you, uh, what we Greeks don't uh, want to admit, she is revolutionary. She re- revolutionized opera. Before uh, Maria Callas, there was no acting in opera. You know, the singer would come in, plot the plot themselves in the middle of the stage, and sing. She brought drama to opera. She brought drama in her voice, you know. Uh, anyone who can hear, you know, uh, three seconds of Maria Callas knows it, it's her voice. And uh, has, uh, kind of, uh, she will survive, I think, longer than he will yeah. because of that, because of how she re- revolutionized, uh, revolutionized opera. Yeah. Nick, can you tell us, speaking of that, can you tell us a little bit about Carnegie Hall with uh, Ma- the Maestro Taboris? Yes. Well, uh, 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 Peter Taboris has uh, c- commissioned an a opera oratorio based on my book, Eleni, and uh, hired uh, a wonderful composer named uh, Nesta Taylor, who's Greek-Australian, uh, and a librettist named Fergus Curry, who is uh, uh, Scottish but has lived in, in Greece for 30 years, married to a Greek woman. And they wrote this opera oratorio with uh, a chorus of 100 singers and six soloists and and a narrator, and I'm the narrator, and it would be presented at Carnegie Hall on March 25th, 2021, the 200th anniversary of Greek independence. Uh-huh. And uh, uh, although uh, Eleni takes place, uh, you know, 120 uh, years later than the Greek Civil War, the end of the Greek Civil War, um, um, it's important, I think, because it shows that Greeks have struggled throughout their history to, to uh, for freedom, and uh, so um, I'm very pleased that it's it's going to happen. I, I hope I hope people can attend concerts by then, you know. Uh, but the the uh, opera of uh, the oratorio is finished, uh, both the music and the and the libretto. I will not sing, so please come. You will. Uh, <laughs> I will just have four brief narrations of. Uh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> to introduce uh, uh, parts of the libretto. Fantastic. No, but it's amazing how things. I mean, the book came out in 1983. It's still in print everywhere, and all these other things. You know, now an opera, a movie. You know, it. Uh, the 
the story keeps uh, coming back in in different forms, you know. Yeah. And uh, um, uh, so it's I'm very pleased that uh, my my sacrifice and love uh, is, uh, is uh, you know is inspiring and uh, moving people uh, uh, more than uh, 72 years after she was executed. Yeah. Um, you're both journalists, and I want you know I, I have to ask you this question, uh, and, and Eleni, I'm going to start with you first, but um, how do how do you see journalism today? From from uh, you know I grew up with Walter Cronkite, you know, and and when Walter said that's the way it is, that's the way it was, you know, uh, uh, as far, as far as facts today, and and it's hard even with this crisis, it's hard to get facts, you know, uh, uh, you get a lot of opinion these days. What it what are your views on, on journalistic, journalistic standards today? Um, and, and, and what, what challenges do you have trying to do, trying to do the right thing? I mean, I think the most challenging thing is not <clears throat> for the journalists themselves who should, you know, follow journalistic ethics, you know, regardless, but for the citizens, I think sort of citizens have to act as journalists now and be suspicious of everything they read because, um, you know, every uh, everybody is spouting facts. Everyone can post, repost things, um, especially you know, edit things every to, citizen to has to like their opinions. Do a little journalism on, little on their stuff. own, and I think it's also unfortunate that um, the uh, we don't support journalism in the way we used to in terms of uh, fact checking and and even copy editing. I think a lot of standards. Um, have fallen. I'm um, inspiring that everyone sort of has the tools in some ways, the, the technical tools to be a journalist now. Um, and we see that all the time with um, like, look at the George Floyd, um, that wasn't a journalist uh, who taped that and, and it caused so many changes that are still happening. Right now, that was a 17 year old girl. So um, I think everyone, journalists and citizens have an obligation to uh, you know, be ethical and fact-based and not um, accept things uh, because they sound like something they want to hear. Nick? Well, I'm heart sick <laughs> by uh, seeing where journalism today. It's so subjective rather than what it should be, which is objective. The reporter should be reporting facts, substantiating them, and um, uh, and uh, uh, keeping himself out of the story. Uh, I mean, to fire James Bennett as editor of the editorial page of the New York Times because he printed, uh, he published a uh, an article by a conservative, uh, and uh, and the, the staff to rise and demand his ouster, and the and the publisher to. Uh, uh, cave into that that demand is horrifying to me you know uh, uh, i uh, i um uh, i'm very sorry to see it and and uh, lenny's right the you have to now read every article uh with uh suspicion you know or, or is this the truth or is this uh the uh, the the bias or uh, and uh, bias in public life. Uh, I, I'm horrified of the bias uh, in, uh, in, gen in journalism. Yeah. Well, unless there's any other questions that you have, Marianne? Uh, I wish to thank you, Art First, and the National Hellenic Society for partnering with us, the University Club of Wilmington. I was also reminded during this presentation, and I have a vague memory of it as I was a little girl in Greek school, that you had actually visited Wilmington, Mr. Gage. And yes, I was there, yeah, yeah. yeah. at a graduation, yeah. Yes, yeah. so welcome back, virtually at least. Um, thank you, and Eleni, so, so much for speaking to our membership and our wider community today. These are the ties that bind our shared heritage and culture. And it is 
really an honor to have participated in a conversation with a living legend among us. And um, from one Greek to another, we are really, really fortunate and blessed to have had you with us today. So thank you again. And I want to thank you both as well. Um, Nick, you know, you've done so much in your life, not just through this movie, but, you know, for Vorio Ipirotis. I remember that's the first time I met you when you freed five of them. Yeah. Helped get them free a long time ago here in Washington, D.C. And I think, you know, what you also demonstrated, which is so important, is, is the power of film and books and how it can change things. You know, we just had this horrible thing happen in Constantinople. Uh, yeah. uh, and, 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 you know, just to, to know the story of that and to see a movie about it would be sometimes so much more powerful than, you know, uh, uh, when, when, you know, anything else that you could possibly do because you reach, we, you can reach so many more people through a movie and, you know, you, your movie even touched Ronald Reagan. And, and I, I didn't know that uh, uh, until I read, until I read about, about it in your book. Um, but I want to thank you. Uh, thank you for being our friend. Thank you for being an NHS member. And, and we look forward to it. And next time we'll do it in person. How's that? Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I want to say about the university club. I, I hope uh, university clubs, uh, Hellenic university clubs become stronger and more, um, uh, uh, and more of them. Uh, in the old days, uh, when I was, uh, they were, they, uh, in New York, they would have dances and a lot of Greeks would meet. And a lot of marriages would happen. You know, the, the Rita Wilson's father and mother met at a, a Hellenic University Club dance and get married and produce Rita Wilson, you know, and many others. And uh, it's a, uh, I hope uh, this, uh, this movement becomes stronger. Uh, it's great uh, art, uh, the National Hellenic uh, Society is doing such wonderful work and uh, you're the one that, uh, uh, that puts in the hours and uh, we, we just uh, provide some uh, moral support uh, off and on. And uh, I applaud you and uh, uh, I hope God gives you many years to continue the work. Thank you. Well, I, I'm just a mirror of who we are collectively and individually. And it's an, an incredible, incredible heritage that we're blessed with uh, to carry forward to the next generation so thank you very much and nobody does nobody does it better than this hellenic uh, university club so i hope uh, others follow their lead <laughs>